Uh, so hi, I'm Colin. I'm a volunteer at the Connections Museum, and I've been leading the uh, reassembly of the DMS-10 that we got. Um, OK, so now that we have the machine in the building, it is merely the challenge of wiring it all back together. Um, so we have five different frames. Um, all of those had like a big pile of wires bundled up on top that went with each frame when we pulled it in the building. So um, everything that connected to that frame when it was in the lab, um, they kind of cut it at the far end and bundled up as much of the cable for us as possible and left it attached to this frame, attached to this frame, attached to that frame. Um, so we have been trying to understand what even those wires are. We didn't, it's all sort of news, new to us, so we have to figure out what, is, what are all the cables that need to, that are attached to this frame and that frame and this frame. For, for mechanical reasons, just to get access, we had to put it all up into this, into the, um, the kind of ceiling space above the switch just to get it out of the way. Um, when we first brought it in, we just kind of dropped all the cables on the floor and it was this huge spaghetti mess. Um, and we couldn't even get into the frames with all that cable in the way. So this is up in the cable tray where um, all of these cables are either um, going from one frame to another or they're going from one frame out to where all the trunks get wired in or where all the customers get wired in on a different wire, um, on a distributing frame. Um, so for the moment, the least inconvenient place for us is to have them kind of strapped up here uh, out of the way so we can run all the cables that we need to run in these big cable trays up here. Um, kind of first on our mind is getting the power and the ground. Um, so these sort of <laughs> big handles, big copper handles, are actually where the main battery feed comes in. So it has two different battery feeds, an A feed and a B feed. Um, and so we'll mount a big um, copper wire to each of these, basically. Um, and then there's also a big copper bus bar that has the um, return. So this, that bar is grounded. Um, and so this is step one is wiring everything to these battery and grounds um, before we can deal with the, the litany of other cables that we need to send to the right places. Having all that cable is, is a good thing because that means that we have we don't have to find new cables. We actually have what we need in order to, to wire back together. Um, but it's just a lot to physically sort through. So these are the connectors at the other end from the network. And these are what we're going to have to run to the different frames to actually connect them up to be talking um, to the, the central processor um, of the system. So right now, these are what we all have, that we have um, all bundled up, um, but we're going to have to take these down, unbundle them, run them to the right places, figure out where each connector gets plugged in to make sure that it's in the right place, um, and then test it out and see if we did the right job and, and got those all in the right places or not. The first task has basically been to get power. So all of the power for the frame comes through this set of uh, circuit breakers. And there's a big bus bar. Um, for power on it, up in the cable tray, and there's another big bus bar for ground or uh, return. And so the power comes from the building's power plant to those bus bars, to these circuit breakers, and then from these circuit breakers, it goes out to each of the other four frames, and then those are going to have their own sets of circuit breakers. Um, that distribute it to the individual shelves um, and sometimes half shelves uh, inside of inside of those frames. So we we have those power cables run from the circuit breakers to the individual frames. Um, we haven't connected anything yet because um, a, an early part of connecting everything in the DMS-10 is actually to make sure that the grounding is correct. Um, they are very adamant in the manuals for how to install this. They need to avoid ground loops. You want to make sure that all of the signals, all of the circuitry 
has one connection to ground. Um, this has one connection to ground. This is one path to ground. Um, to avoid introducing noise into the power circuits and that noise then leaking into um, the, the customer's voice signal. Um, so they have all these instructions for how to avoid that at the very beginning of setting up the switch um, because it's easier to get it right then than it is to try and uh, troubleshoot where did your problems come from. If you get some hum uh, from um, the power circuits after you've already wired everything together, then it's kind of too late. You're going to be stuck having to um, go through a really painful debugging process. So we're trying to do the right thing, get the grounding sorted out correctly um, before we go too far on wiring everything back together. So the, the real like focal point of this machine is this pair of shelves. Um, this has the, the processor, the main processor in it. It's duplicated, like all telecom gear. Um, and it also has the, what we call the network, where all of the different voice circuits that are coming from the peripherals, which are all around in the other frames, all those voice circuits come to the network and then get routed from one voice circuit to another circuit. So from one customer to another, those connections are made inside of this duplicated pair of of frames. So this is really like the core of the switch doing switch things. And then a lot of the other units around here are basically um, those peripherals which have connections to the network frame and provide either a bunch of customer circuits or they provide um, uh, some sort of interface to the outside world for the network frames. Um, so when we, we have these um, shelves here full of line cards where individual customers, um, their phone lines are connected inside these drawers, this has a whole bunch of connections to the network. Um, over here we have a bunch of trunks going out to other switches, other um, destinations in the telephone network. And so these also have their own connections to the network. And the network does this kind of matching between customers on that side and trunks on this side to make those connections for, for calls to complete. Um, that's sort of the core functionality of, of what this switch is doing here. So this is the, uh, the thing that actually runs the, the code that, that does the work of, of this switch. So we know they've gone through various iterations of this processor over the uh, like 25 years of development of this switch. So every um, after a while, it's, it's time to upgrade to a new processor um, to get more capabilities. Um, and just because sometimes you, you can't get the old hardware as, as easily as you can get newer equipment. So um, this is uh, the last generation of processor. Um, it's a... Um, uh, PowerPC architecture. Uh, so like an FPGA on there doing something? Yeah, I don't actually, I haven't, I don't know what each of them do. Yeah. Um, there's, there's FPGAs lurking all over to do sort of individual specialized routing and network functions. Right. Um, so this is the card with the, the hard drive on the, um, that runs, that has the program for the computer. Um, so sort of mounted through the board here. And so this actually contains all the program that drives the computer. Um, and also contains uh, information about this particular switch. So what lines are where, what trunks are where, all that sort of information that tells the switch how it is configured um, in particular. This was kind of a core element of um, for us to bring the switch back to, back to life, we want to make sure that the data on here are good. Um, we want to understand that we, like, we want to keep that data safe, basically, is the most important thing, because uh, we can't go ask Nortel for another copy now. So, And then because this entire shelf is duplicated, there's another hard drive um, on this shelf as well. So um, everything here has a redundancy uh, built in. And <laughs> that's good from our uh, preservation perspective as well. And it also gives us a chance to 
um, look at the contents of the drive in isolation um, to understand what we even have. So um, make sure that we can kind of try and see what is on the disk, what, what does it tell us about the way that the switch was set up, um, which will help us when we're trying to boot this from cold and we kind of don't know what to expect um, in that situation. So these are all, yeah, these are all just like kernel symbols, vgit, vref, vput. So explain, explain oh, for the audience, Matt, as if we're seeing this for the first time, what you are doing and what we're looking at and why so we're looking at it. I went, I went to uh, the hardware re PC hardware recycling place and got stuff to read the disks from the DMS-10. And while I'm waiting on it to load off the disk, because it is hardwired into the slowest SCSI mode you possibly can be, uh, I'm just running strings on the image and uh, scrolling through all of the symbols that exist in its binaries and whatnot. Uh, so I'll have, it, it's about eight, eight gigabytes of disk and like can kind of see some of its kernel messages that it might spit at us one day. Some of these I hope to never see. What is Chorus OS? That's like the second time I've seen something refer, refer to Chorus. So I wonder if that's their uh, like embedded operating system or something. So it's good news that we can read off this disc the too because seem to be great. Um, you know we had these in the truck. Stupidly, we had these in the back of the truck, mounted in the in the chassis, like in the in the card cage, um, and it's like essentially a quantum fireball. <laughs> uh, it's. And if and you don't, it's a quantum Atlas five, yeah, which makes uh, in in history. I guess it's fitting since we got a quantum Atlas five drive in Huntsville. Mm. Uh, yeah, so like here, here's more references to chorus, like some version number out of somebody's NFS directory from these. Okay, the, the, this was definitely C plus mm plus. -hmm. This was a weird C++ compiler. This was definitely C++ at some point. Uh, module uninstall. Responsible for uninstalling all components of the patch bundle. These are tickle scripts. Yep. You can tell because of the... And the fact that it says its name is under uninstall.tickle. Yeah, that too. So the, the other nice thing, and I was saying this before the camera was rolling, is that we looked and this is, um, some of the strings in here show us that this is generic 602, which is the most recent um, yeah, generic for this machine. Is, everything is chorus underscore 60220. Yeah. And for those of you who are not initiated in, in telephone switch lingo, generic is the word for the software package. So Nortel had a bunch of generics. There was recently, oh, you here, know. Here's the upgrade script from 50210 to 60220. Right, 502 was the previous generic. And uh, so this is running the newest software you can get for this machine. After that, they, there was never a generic 7 anything. So... So this is the backside of the network. Um, this is the computer and sort of call routing network um, that we were looking at on the front. Um, and here's where all of those connections to the peripherals are. So each one of these bundles um, is a, a bunch of circuits that one of the peripherals can put telephone calls on. So this bundle is all going to other frames here, either to the line cards where the customers come in, um, or it's going to the trunks where the um, connection to the outside world is. So um, part of making everything talk to, each, talk to each other again is going to be connecting all of these, um, they call them loops, um, from the network to everywhere else in the switch. Uh, so for me, the fun of this project is that it's a system that, um, that I don't know very well, that none of us here know very well, because it's into that kind of digital era where um, a lot of us have spent a lot of time working on the analog machine, the, the mechanical machines, um, but this is kind of a new realm for us. And so we have to learn how things evolved 
in the 1970s from the uh, mechanical hardwired era into this kind of digital controlled um, era that the, the DMS-10 is from. This is, this is our first time working on a lot of these systems before. We don't have much familiarity with this. Um, it's not something that we've, we've worked on for, for our entire careers. So um, there's a lot of kind of new material for us to, to learn about and understand and understand how did the engineers put this system together when they were trying to um, first build it in 1970s. Hi, I'm Claire Violet. You might remember me from such other YouTube titles uh, as the thumbnail of the plug polishing video and clean your own relay goo and save. I'm here to talk to you about some new t-shirts that I've spent a lot of time designing. If you can visit the Seattle Museum in the next few months, you may be able to purchase a DMS-10 t-shirt and a number three ESS t-shirt. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, if you would enjoy those on some sort of e-commerce platform, please leave a comment. It's hard to gauge interest levels since we're all volunteers at a nonprofit museum. So if that's something you would be excited about, please let us know. Thanks to Colin for talking about the cool stuff, and thanks for watching. Bye.